Namaskara. Good morning to all of you. I, I, for those who don't know me, I'll give a brief introduction. I am Hari Ram, V. Hari Ram. I am an abstract painter. And uh, recently, I have, I have also got into installation. I'm making installations. So in continuation of the previous lecture, I, I would like to uh, briefly go into it. I would like to briefly recap on what was uh, done earlier so that it will be easier for you to follow the, the ensuing chapter. So I'll do a quick recapitulation of the, see, I, I feel comfortable standing. So I'll do a quick re recap of the earlier one. I started with the semantics of semi-abstraction. See, the semantics is nothing but the language. It's the theory. It's the philosophy behind the subject. So abstraction is, uh, semi-abstraction is, which is not totally abstract. So the total abstraction could be a visual experience of something that you see, or it could be conceptual some kind of, it could have some spiritual connotation also to it. But before coming to abstraction, I will deal with the semi-abstract. Briefly, I will tell you on this. So last time I was talking about the Stone Age. The Stone Age, in, uh, we, in the Stone Age, in India, we basically had what is the icons, the Hindu pantheon. The Hindu pantheon is nothing but the deities. So here you see a Hoysala sculpture of one of the temple sculptures, which has got those days, you know, they gave a symbolic meaning to these uh, sculptures, which means to say even the position of the hands and then the chakras and all that had a significance. But this particular one, which I randomly picked up, has been vandalized because people didn't understand the significance of the Hindu pantheon which was also at the iconography, which was a translation of what it exa exactly means like. So now in this, uh, you see the Stone Age, because from the beginning, uh, earlier Mr. Prakash was dealing, it, dealing from the cave, cave period, you know, the prehistoric. So coming to the Stone Age, this was where we started from the uh, Indian iconography, I mean, uh, Hindu pantheon. Now in Hindu pantheon, what happens is, uh, they have derived all this from the Panchabhutas. The Panchabhutas is the, uh, you know, the fire and uh, water, earth, vayu and, uh, you know, akash and all that is the Panchabhuta. So from the Panchabhutas, the gods and goddesses were derived from that until we have all the Navagrahas and all that you must, I explained in the previous one. So from there, I'll, this is a brief recap. So now, then the Bronze Age came up. So this is one of the Chola bronzes of an, uh, of an idol. So this was the Hindu pantheon. So in Hindu, in our Eastern culture, it started from the Stone Age and the Bronze Age from the Panchabhutas, what I explained. So after that, we had the Western influence and canvas painting. So when Ravi Verma started painting, all these Hindu pantheon gods and goddesses, which he put as Saraswati, Lakshmi, and all that, you know, even he did the Seshasayana and all that, which had a symbolic reference to our uh, spiritual uh, connectivity with these gods and goddesses. So how it explains all these as metaphors, independently of what you see, and collectively as a gestalt, it has a certain meaning. So therefore, it has also been, see, the abstraction is a Western term, but we never used it as abstraction. So in our thing, we symbolically represented that through the form content, where each of those forms had a meaning which was carried out as an iconographical reference. So now, if you take, now Stone Age, I am just going after that, I am skipping and going to the Western thought. If you see from the cave, age, uh, cave, I mean the cave period, you know, the Paleolithic and the Neolithic and the hieroglyphics and petroglyphs and all that, we had also the evolution from, they also had the evolutionary state where they came into the Stone Age. At that time, they were using marble, stone and all that. Here you see the Michelangelo's uh, Pita, which is there. The dead Christ on the lap of the Mother Mary. So now, 
I am coming to Stone Age from Stone when it came to the modern period, like we had Picasso. Instead of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci for a painter, we had Picasso for a painter, and from sculpture from Michelangelo, we had uh, Henry Moore. So here you see one of the sculptures of Henry Moore, which is stone, which is given the contemporary version. So contemporary in extension to installation art, engaging bronze, steel, and other mixed media material. So what happened now we are in an age where after the bronze, we had the Iron Age. During the Iron Age, since the metal is very heavy, artists were not engaging with the iron as much as they were engaging with bronze and stone. So later period, what happened during the contemporary period, now presently what has happened because of the technology that is available to us, the artists are trying various me mediums. Like, like also, you know, installations and all that. And also they give performances and all that. There are performances, artists also who do it. Like uh, here, we see the dimple shaw here. So here, see this is again bronze. But here what has happened is, this lady, what she has done is, she is uh, Deborah Bur Butterfield. Actually, I went and saw the sculptures in Seattle. She had a show in Seattle. What she used to do is, she used to collect the driftwood. The driftwood is nothing but, see, uh, on the seashore, all the wood from the forest, you know, when, they when the branches and all that break, they are they get drifted by the sea they come to the shores so they had come to the seattle shores because seattle was sea you know the uh, western part of the america so what she used to do is she used to collect this driftwood and then dry them up some of them used to be dry now you must know that the, the driftwood had so, lot of colors it was not just ash color it had copper color all this you know the the, uh, the branches had different, because of the age, each branch would have attained a certain age. And they say even the old branch, wood, you know, it can get converted into stone after ages. So what happens is, this leaves, the surface of the bark has several tones. It has, it has even copper tones and all that. So what she did was, she collected this wood, driftwood, and then assembled that, because since she is an, she is an artist, who had a command over drawing and all that. She could draw the horse meticulously and bring the same shape with the driftwood. She assembled this and brought the shape of the horse. Here you can see the horse, but she didn't leave it at that. After that, this has been cast in bronze, and it's called microcasting in bronze. It's a very advanced technology. I wouldn't know details about how they do the microcasting bronze, but it's a microcasting bronze. When you go near and uh, just tap it, you can see the metallic sound. It looks like wood, but it's a microcasting cast bronze. So she did horses of various, various forms, like running horses, seated horses, and all that. So she exhibits the horse is almost like a stallion, which is as much more higher than a human. Uh, uh, maybe this is about 10 feet or something. Like that. Some of them are 8 feet and all that, but the biggest size would be probably 10 feet in height. I'm saying from the tip of the head to the floor. So you see the bronze, how it has changed now. The concept, see, when you see the eastern, this is what the change. Eastern thing, you saw the bronzes, our uh, bronzes. But in western, what happened, they never had the bronzes. So the western culture, they brought these bronzes like this. They used even bronze sculptures and all that they made. But she is, since she is in the contemporary period, she is given a version like this. Now you see, this is one of the installations of Subodh Gupta where he's used uh, the steel vessels. All the steel vessels from, she must have brought from uh, all the, you know, the steel stores and then put it together. So you can see a whole uh, waterfall of uh, thing which is coming from the bucket. It's raining, uh, which shows that in the in Indian culture, it shows something about the Indian culture where we extensively use the steel. So that's what I think it's mostly. It was exhibited at the National Museum, I think, in Delhi. Then, when you come to this, this is called the bean. Commonly, it is called the bean, which is there at the Chicago Art Institute. So this bean was uh, done by Anish Kapoor. 
So he did this. It's a, I think it's not chromium plated, but it must be pure steel, I think so. So he's done it out of steel. See, now steel age. So in the modern period, there's a lot of technological advancement. So our century is in a technological development. Therefore, what happened? There are lots of material that is found. So you could use fiberglass, you can use plaster of Paris, there are so many things, you know, you can use even found objects and then construct. So the artists expanded their scope of creating installations by using anything, anything that was available to their perception. So here you see it's here, the abstraction is only when you see that as a, he calls it as cloud gate. Now the cloud gate is because it, the, the entire structure is reflecting the city of Chicago. This is at the Art Institute in Chicago. So it reflects and you see the people are entering through the gate. So it's a cloud gate. It's also showing the uh, entire, the, you can see the cloud there and then they're passing through the cloud. So it's a whole huge structure which is, called, which is commonly known as bean, big bean, but Anish Kapoor has titled it as uh, cloud gate. And you can see another version of the cloud gate which you see in the, uh, when the sun is setting, it creates a beautiful effect like this. So it's an installation, it's a huge sculpture, whatever you can call it. It's a semi-abstract you can say, because it has a certain meaning also given to it. So the abstraction becomes when there is no concept to be explained, it becomes a semi-abstract. See now here, you see, again I'm showing this uh, in continuation of last time. See how materials are used. Here this guy, uh, Damien Hurst, who is an American artist, he has used a uh, shark. The shark, he has, you know, I don't know exactly the terminology, but they call in Mysore we had this uh, tiger, lion and all that. What they do is they used to stuff it. It's called taxidermy. Taxidermy, yeah. So that is done, but I don't know what, what's the process here. So Damien Hurst has actually taken a live, uh, I mean, uh, not live one, it's a, it's a filled uh, shark. So he's put it into a kind of fish tank. So here what happens, he says an abstract installation could be seen as semi-abstract installation also, you can see it. Why it is called semi-abstract? Because he gives two versions of it. One he calls it as, Death is physically impossible for a mind that is alive. That means the shark is actually wriggling. It wants to get out, it wants to cut free. It wants, it's a human quest. See, every one of us, we are into this room. Supposing I talk, uh, start talking and uh, the whole day if I am talking, then you want, you get sick, you will get sleep. Many of you will go to sleep and you want to get out of this room. So once you go home, after some time, you want to get out of the house. So it's the human quest to expand. So the, that's why you want the boundless. So you're never happy with what you achieved, you know. So you always want to achieve more. So here the fish is wriggling. It's suffering. It wants uh, to die instantly. But it has a physical body. But the mind is suffering. It can't get itself free. So it's a beautiful expression, which is one of my favorite installations. I saw this at uh, two, three places in the US. It's being guarded also by, you know, there are guards with the guns and all standing. They tell you not to cross the yellow line. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a dummy. That's why I was telling about taxidermy. Taxidermy is stuffing, but I don't know what they call when a shark is stuffed, you know. So maybe it's uh, the same terminology. And then he says physically, imp physical impossibility of death for a mind that is alive. So either way, you know, they, it's the same meaning, but he gives a different version. Maybe he is making it like uh, edition. How in printmaking you have editions, you know? He might be making, producing several of them to cater to the needs of American uh, museums, which are quite a number of them, you know, so. And here you see, now, when, you, when the same thing is a painting, it becomes a wall painting. It's a huge painting, or it can be called a mural. But here it's not a mural, because what happens, a mural should, can be put even outdoors. It will take the weather. But here what happens is assemble the balloons. 
So the balloon, one, one prick, the balloon will blast off. So this is a material which is not permanent. So some artists have used impermanent material also to create uh, insulation. It's not that you have to create it as a concrete thing. Some of the installations can be de demolished, some of them can be removed, some of them can be permanently retained. Some of them are uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're not permanent. So that impermanence nature itself has made it an installation. So it's, it's one of the installations which, is, which has been kept in one of the museums, I think so. So the influence of spiritualism and occult on modern art. So now, I last, last, in my last lecture, I told you about how we have evolved in the East. And then I told you how from canvas painting, how we came into this, uh, you know, the Kali Ghat and all that. And then we came to the Shantini Ketan, the Baroda and the progressive group in uh, Bombay. And then like that, you know, and then there was a transformation we took from the West and there was an influence from the West we went into the threshold of modern art to the modern art period, then the postmodernism and the new century art has also come in. So that, that apart, so that was a recap on the semi-abstraction. Now when you kept, come to the abstraction, how the abstract movement started in the West. So basically, I'll just have some water. I get exhausted because of my age. Yeah. Now, the influence of spiritualism and the occult on, of modern art, he says. So what is this occult? See, in our thing, you must notice that in our God, uh, pantheon, we don't have ghosts or spirits. We never have ghosts. We have devas and asuras and, you know, the demigods, the, uh, you know, the, the, the avatars were all the time they were killing Narakasura and all that. So we never, we had only demigods, gods, demigods, and the, uh, what is that, Rakshasas and all that we had. But we never spoke about spirit coming or that. But in Western countries, what happened was, even if you take US and all that, you know, they came from that wild west and all that. So when they came, dur probably during the wild west period, I think, the influence of spiritualism and occult in modern art, he says. Occult means they were talking with the spirits. So how it started? It started with the Fox sisters. So the Fox, the occult practice in New York came in 1830 when these three Fox sisters, what they did was they, they were in a house and they started talking with the spirits. The, you know, we use this plank chart and all that, you know. So they started conversing with these ghosts and spirits. And the people believed it because at that time they proved that they could communicate with the dead spirits. So these three sisters were almost established and believed. The Fox sisters believed to be in communication with ghosts and spirits. So the, the communication of ghosts and spirit, what does it tell you? that eventually, that means there is the rebirth. Is it, there's reincarnation. So the, that got into their curiosity. Because once you are dead, you are dead and gone. But if you're communicating with the dead spirits, that means the life is extended. So it uh, raised the curiosity of the people. So they wanted to know if this really, these Fox sisters were bluffing or they were really. L later on, maybe things changed. These Fox sisters fell down because they agreed that they went and said that we didn't practice anything like that. Because that was because of several political reasons and all that. But they did con come in contact with the occult. In, uh, in, that's what the uh, history says. So you can see here the Fox sisters lived in this place where the starting point of modern spiritualism in America, it says. So the starting point of spiritualism in America is not, is not the kind we did. Our spiritual, we were talking about Panchabhutas and all that. And then even there we saw Bhutas because they were devilish. The fire can be devastating. Water can be devastating. So they also saw that as Bhutas, but also they saw us that they were the elements which the body is made of, and we were surviving in that. We are a part, part of that nature, the whole, whole entirety of that cosmic thing. 
So what happened here, the Fox test, you can see this. It says the Fox test on the site events of uh, March 31st, is it? 1948, began, began, began sisters. sisters, Maggie and something, Kate, and all that. But you must see this, if you see this, you can see the birthplace of modern spiritualism, he says. So upon the site stood the, what is this? Hans Heights Villa, is it? Cottage, the home of uh, Fox Sisters, through whose med mediumship, says, communication with the spirit world was established in March 31st, 1848. So I was born in 1948, almost 100 years before. <laughs> so the, through the mediumship, there is no death. There is no, there are no dead. Placed here are, that something is written, okay, December 7th. So here it says there's no death. That means there's a reincarnation. So they believed in that. Then what happened in the later development, Georgiana Houston, in 1818 to 1884, she painted about the spiritual art. She, she called it a spiritual. At the same time, you remember in our Indian thing, we had the tantric, you know, the Bhopal where, after J. Swaminathan, the uh, Birande, G.R. Santosh and all that. So they were doing the similar thing. But in West, we didn't know. We were not in communication with them because they were somewhere. We didn't even have phone contact with them. But then you can see this, this lady had a catalog. She said, Spirit Drawings in Watercolor, New British Gallery. So this is a catalog of that. And it says 19, 1871. 1871, it was there. And then uh, she made, a, she had an exhibition of this, and you can see her painting. It's so complicated. It's an abstract work she has done, but it's not abstract. She, they didn't call it as abstract because we didn't, we had no te terminology called abstract at that period. So that period we were, we had not even started. The modern art period had not started. So there was not question of abstraction was not there. I, I have not, it, it's a, it's a, it just says some soul or something. She, she has put it as spirit. I have not got the title, some of them, because they are. Yeah, uh, so for the purpose of discussion, I thought it's, it's not necessary to go into too many details. So the British Gallery, it says, and she has shown, and she says spirit drawings in water, watercolor, she says. So this must be watercolor. But the way she is done, you can see that. So if it has been done in 1871, you can imagine, that was the starting point where these people thought, took art as a spiritual journey. So artists were taking it as a, as a curiosity to know what the uh, afterlife is. So here you can see this. It's a complicated painting which she has done in the, those early days. And they were exhibiting. Rudolf Steiner, I have not brought too many slides because, you know, she's done a body of work. I can't show everything here. So Rudolf Steiner must be from Germany. He is 1861 to 1925. Also, the, see, he says soul. And then he put a human body and then he created it. This is all, again, the tantric. See, I also told you about the Dattatriya last year, last time, where in Hindu pantheon, we have created the Dattatriya where you see the Vishnu, Mahavishnu, Shiva, and uh, Brahma together, the three heads. And then he is, uh, the Kamadenu or something is there. And then you have the four dogs, which are uh, Rig, Yajur, Sama, and Adarvana Veda. So the Rig Veda has the white dog. The Sama Veda has got the little white, brownish white. And then the brown dog, Sama Veda, Atarvana is the black one. So Atarvana is the occult. So Atharvana Veda had the uh, Tantra, Mantra, and then the Yantras and all that it had. So from that also has the occult has uh, I mean, evolved from there. So in the West, it has evolved from the inspiration of the spirits. They knew that there is a spirit. So they must have believed that even those who had a doubt that Jesus Christ had reincarnation, they would have believed that he is there. It establishes that he must be there. He is a holy ghost. So now what happened? The soul. See, he paints a soul like this. So it's also the fire and water element, everything combined together here. 
the earth also, you can see the base of the earth. So all the elements are there, but he is shown as a spirit. So this, they, they imagine that there is spirit existing like this. So after that, you can see Hilma of Klimt. She has exhibited in the Guggenheim those days. And uh, those days, it was the Peggy Guggenheim. Now it's the Solomon Guggenheim. At Peggy Guggenheim, she has exhibited these works, which are almost similar to our, uh, you know, you can see those works. It's almost like our tantric painters, you know. So here she has done this swan. She's done a series of this swan. That is, you know, the upper world. She, it gets touch, in touch with the upper world or something like that. It must be, I mean, it, see now here, swan 17, she says, the title. But uh, what we gather, I don't know how much uh, you must be able to say. <laughs> Actually, there, there is a parallel. Okay. Western, uh, like in a European, yeah. we have alchemy. Yeah. Mm. and all those things, the spiritual elements were already there in 16th century, not even 18th century. Right. Pre uh, the day which he was in. Okay. So it was already there. It was already. I think uh, you're talking more American. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. No, it, it was there in our thing also. But I told you about the Panchabhutas and all that. Our evolution was totally different. Even the Tantric, it was not, we have the mantras and all which we chant, which can be used for negative purposes to help somebody in a positive way. That's how some of the practitioners, they go down the drain because they wrongly use it. Atharva Veda is a great Veda, but the way it is going to be used is also very important. So those principles were not in the West. They were just believing that the spirit Holy Ghost existed, that's it. And that they themselves were this one, and they have to, that consciousness, they thought that it exists there. So again, this is another one which he gives the similar title. And then here you can see Yama, is it Kunz? Yeah, I thought. Yama. Kunst. Kunst is an artist, I think. See, you can see uh, her work here. It's all like the tantric also, similar to that, but it's also has an abstraction. Agnes Palton, and then he's done these works. So these, these are why I'm showing this, is because up to 1961 it was going on. So since 1880s, 1848, it's gone up to 1961 here. I have just skipped. There are lots of artists and works to be shown. But since we have this session for discussion also, I'm just showing it. So, so it is at that time what happened. Madam Blavatsky and this other person, they in 18, 1875 of the Theosophical Society, she founded the Theosophical Society. So, so the Theosophical Society, you know, she took from all the Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all combinations she took and then studied and then she, the Theosophical Society was created. Even now we have in Chennai here also we have. Yeah, we have, we have. Yes, we have. When we are young, we used to go there, you know, Barzangudi area, it's there. So she started this uh, movement and then I think it's here that uh, Kandinsky was inspired by the Theosophists. So later, Blavatsky passes on her organization to a much younger lady, Annie Besant. So in Tamil Nadu, they call her Annie Besant Ammayar. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So Annie Besant is also there. After that, she came, and then she was the thing who brought that color theory and all that. So she, she wrote Annie Besant uh, thought forms. So you can see that she created these thought forms, how color the color which had got connected with the spirituality, the, uh, the, uh, the temperament of color, the understanding of the color in different terms. It, had, it is again semantics. It's a, it's a kind of theory, it's a kind of philosophy also. It's a kind of language which is spoken, which is an abstract language. It communicates, the color also communicates to you a certain language. So the spiritual in art, abstract painting, 1890 to 1985. So here, Kandinsky. This is how Kandinsky was uh, very much, I had a, I have some papers on this, but uh, it would be too much for me to read. I didn't bring them because it's a whole uh, sheet of uh, letter why he was inspired by uh, theosophists and what was his ideology. So the spiritual in art is something which he propounded and then said how artists react in three different ways and how they evolve 
and what is the final thing, how they come into the spiritual aspect of life and all that. So I'm not going into too much of that because you can read it. You can get uh, information on this. If you want further to study on this, probably you can Google about uh, the spiritual in art, Kandinsky. And then you also had Kandinsky. I should also mention about Pete Mondrian during the same time he was there. He was constructing with the verticals and the horizontals. The vertical was the male aspect and the horizontal was the female aspect. So male and he said there are only two aspects to this and there's no angle to it. It has to be followed. So what happened initially, Theo van der Berg, another artist, he concurred with him and they were both, they both started the, I, I don't know how you spell that, but the, the style, D S T L G it is. I don't know how they uh, pronounce it in uh, Western countries. It's called the, the style. They started these two, started this movement called the style. The Theo van der Berg and uh, uh, later what happened, Theo van der Berg was uh, tempted to do commission works and all that, where he created for rest from restaurants, you know, he created an angle. So he created a 45 degree angle to that. I had one of his very early books, I lost it. I had a very early, his first show, the Theo van der Berg show. So what Theo van der Berg did was he created that 45 degree angle and they both fell out. So Theo van der Berg left the, this, uh, the style group and then Pete Mondrian continued to publish his papers and then Pete Mondrian established the theory of uh, verticality and horizontal as the only thing. You can see that in his works. So Wes Kandinsky was uh, concerning the spiritual art of painting in particular Wesley Kandinsky. So Kandinsky started something like this in abstraction. So these were his earlier things which had the combination of a certain form and abstraction. So it's not totally uh, formless, but it has got, but still it has abstraction because there are no distinct forms as such which give you as a concept or give you a scope to understand it in a different way that you see through a, as a concept and then has a certain explanation like it's not a, uh, you know, uh, narrative. It's not like a, like a social narrative which explains a certain thing and all that. So here you see the forms because as an artist what happens straight away, no one, uh, certain artists felt it difficult to come to abstraction. Some of them had the talent as a by birth, they were abstractionists. They could do abstraction at, at a free will. But certain artists had to evolve. They had to get out of the form content and gradually come to a level of abstraction. So that must have happened even to Kandin, I mean, uh, uh, Kandinsky. So this is another Kandinsky where he uses the geometrical pattern. You also see the tantric thing and also that, you know, what we call as chakras and all that, that kind of thing is there. It has been there. So Paul Klee is Paul Klee. Paul Klee is another very interesting artist. When you talk about spirituality, he says, the heart that beat for this world. In 1915, he wrote this uh, statement in his book. He said, the heart that beat for this world has almost been extinguished in me. It is as though my only bond with these things were memory. One relinquishes this world and builds into a region beyond a region of all affirmation. The cool romanticism of this style without pathos is astounding, he said. That means to say, he says the heart that beat for this world has almost been extinguished, which he got disconnected. So that means he was like a saint. He relinquished. He, he never wanted the earthly living. So he wanted to go into another dimension, a plane of existence, where he will find kind of, uh, you know, he will live there. It is free of pathos. So he says, the heart that beat for this world has almost been extinguished. It is as though my only bond with these things. It detaches himself. These things were a memory. One relinquishes, who? One, this kind of thought person, he relinquishes, uh, one relinquishes this uh, uh, thought, I am sorry, I, I couldn't recollect. One relinquishes this world and builds into a region beyond. A region of all affirmation. What is this region beyond? Region is that dimension 
of existence where you get into a spiritual, it's not, I mean, spiritual plane means it's a terminology, that's all. In India, we don't have something called spiritual like that, we don't have. Spiritual means that state of consciousness where he goes into that way, where everything has been repudiated, the form content has been repudiated. There is no structure, there is no outline, there is no body, there is no bounded, bond, bondedness. There is a release from the contour. So the forms are not there. So the abstraction comes there. When you go into that plane of existence where nothingness, he sees as nothingness, but still there is another world. He says there is one. So it's not that we only saw that as moksha and then we go there. What is moksha? When you release and go into that freedom and you go into that plane. So that kind of thing existed even in Paul Klee. So Paul Klee, even the Western artists saw that spiritualism through their kind of perception in a way and they could conceive that through the paintings. So here you see Pete Mountain, what I told you, he has the vertical and horizontal lines. Only, only with this, till the end he did this. But uh, some of them he has made some little deviation, I wouldn't understand un unless I go very deep into that subject, but any of you interested, you can go through that. And then this is blue poles. This was one of the first abstract painting that was bought by the uh, an Australian uh, museum. Sydney, I think it's in Sydney. They paid about two million dollars for this painting. Blue Poles was done by Jackson Pollock, who was the first abstractionist to exhibit at so Peggy, Peggy Guggenheim. So you can see the Blue Poles. He is given something. I mean, I, we we really don't know the meaning of it, but you can uh, you can gather something about the Blue Poles. So this is one of the action paintings which he did. So here what happened, you can see that there is a kind of change like a sea wave, you know, one wave overlapping the other. So one, one uh, ism or one movement overlaps the other. So here Pollock is one of the uh, uh, case, of, case in point where you started starting from Pete Mondrian, Kandinsky to Pollock. And from Pollock there were a host of American abstract painters who did differently until Mark Rothko, Clifford Still and all this other artists, de Kooning and uh, Motherwell and all that. Here you can see a Willem de Kooning abstraction. This is abstract. The abstract is, could be, it's a visual experience. And also if you see it in terms of spirituality, this is the spirituality, you know. The artist continues that as a spiritual journey into the unknown. Clifford Still, he is another uh, American artist. And then this is Robert Rauschenberg. See, Ra 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 Rauschenberg also he does the abstraction, but he introduces certain elements like, this is a, I have seen this work, it is actually there's a bird. There's a bird in front, which has been stuffed. So he has put some objects into that. I think in MoMA it's there. And, yeah? It, you, you can't uh, take it as semi-abstract. It is an abstract work, but it has no theory as such. Unless you are able to explain it with some narrative, you know. If you see the distinct form content. See, it's a, it's a kind of semi-abstract, but may, it, is, it is an abstract also, but... It's an extent. It's an extent. Yes. See, for instance, if you, call, if you take Michael Schufer, when he shows Rauschenberg, he shows a pure abstract like this in his book. He doesn't show this. Because where uh, Michael Super, he says, 50 years of accomplishment from the times of Pete Mondry and Kandinsky to the present. So when he says that, when you see Rauschenberg, he shows Rauschenberg's full abstraction there because he's talking about abstract painting. So he doesn't show this. But during the evolution, I said even uh, form content could be there. But it may not give a full narrative like a social narrative. You may not have a story to tell in that, you know. So it could be just an object which is put. Like I saw one of Rauschenberg's painting where between two paintings is put a ladder. So it could mean anything. The ladder is something, if you see metaphorically, a ladder is to climb up or climb down. So between two paintings, maybe he says that between the painting, the painting is... Uh, I am sandwiched between the painting, eventually I am going up, something like that. He could give his, exp I am giving it as if I am uh, Rauschenberg, but what he has got to say, I don't, do not really know, you know. It's like that. So now you see this here, he has put all that stop symbol and all that, it looks like a hustle bustle city and then which is in chaos and all that, but 
we never know, you know. He has just made a collage out of it, and then he put it in an abstract form. Maybe he got interested. See, each artist has got, they've got a way of expression. So each artist has a way of presenting that, and the material, how they use. One, one could use just a canvas with oils, one could do with acrylics, one could use pencils and acrylic, one could use uh, something else with the acrylics or watercolor or mixed media, something like that. So in the process of creativity, what transpires is what an artist gets inspired. If he gets inspired, he is able to transform that material into a work of art. That is it. So it's, it's a sensibility. It's more than intellectual play, it's a sensibility. Intellectually, we can explain so many things, but sensibility is something which is, uh, with which you can use your senses to see what it is. You can appeal to your senses rather than demanding that a painting should speak. See, here, even here, you see, it's a, he has used something like a war truck and all that. Maybe it was during the Second World War, you know, when the Holocaust was going on. He must have got some inspiration. That's why you see the color also is just that, some kind of grays and uh, you know sepia tones and all that. So this is Jasper Johns. Jasper Johns also has done abstractions. I have seen him paint a clock with a needle and all that. He stuck a lot of papers on top of it. But this is another work of the American uh, national flag which has done. I think he is perhaps he is the first artist who did the national flag this way. And there's a lot of versions he has done. He's done one with totally white, with all the stars and all that. He's done one that shows all the 52 states or something in the United States. And then uh, Jasper Johns also is considered as an abstractionist. Because what does a flag say? It has got some message through the flag. But it looks like an abstract design. And here, Robert Motherwell. Now, Robert Motherwell is an artist who used to basically use black as the color. So all his canvases had black patches. So when Robert Motherwell was asked, what does it mean? What does this black patch mean? He said, the black gives, makes a hole into the canvas. It literally makes a hole into the canvas. Now, recently in uh, Detroit, in Michigan, I saw a in one of the museums there, it has a small museum, I saw one work by Anish Kapoor. This guy has done a huge, it's a, it's a huge, uh, maybe about 10, 10 uh, feet diameter. It's a huge, like a, it looks like our Indian vada, or it might look like a donut. It looks like a donut with a hole inside, you know, with the chocolate sauce on top and then the, this hole. And when you see through that, it's a wall, right? When you see through that, you see it's a, there's a tunnel going inside. It looks black and tunnel. Because he has, I think he has put some kind of convex or concave mirror. Maybe it's convex. A convex lens, the light, through the light when you see, it creates a endless. So where is the place in the wall? You, you are able to see a hole on the wall, endless hole. So that's his concept. It's an abstraction. See how the artist's brain works, it's that. I was also telling about Whitney. I went to Whitney Museum, and this is basically all the African Americans they exhibit there in Whitney. So one of the um, one of the exhibits where there's a plate which is rolling like that, you know, it's rotating, and then on top of that there's a house, and this house has windows, doors, and all that which are just banging and then they are shutting open and closing, and it's making huge noise. As you ascend the stair, you are able to hear the noises. It's a huge installation which is double the size of this wall. That's the only exhibit. And it's making a lot of noise. It, probably the artist wants to say that it's, uh, the house is not stable. Any house, you know, he compares that to any house, there is an instability in that house. So some chaotic thing is happening. How to stop it? It's a problem. But how, how do you find a solution to put, it, put a stop to that? So that's how he is looking at it. So each artist what he is, uh, has a concept. So you can either show it in a figurative form on a canvas. You can show it in an installation. You can show it in a public performance like how you do, you know. So you can do that. Maybe you imagine tornado. Tornado, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like that. So it's, it's a perception, sense perception. How you look at it and what you gather from it is what you get. So it is, uh, abstraction is something 
it can be optical. It can be totally optical. It's totally optical in the sense, supposing you go to a sari shop. I used to give this example very much. When you get a, go to a sari shop, now you wear this black and this blue. Supposing I give you black and red, post office color red I give you, would you wear it? You will not wear it. I mean, you may wear it for your performance or something, but if you want to come to this some place, you may not like that color combination. So the color combination is something, again, abstract in you. Why, what you wear, I am not interested in wearing. What I am wearing, you don't like it. The taste differs. In your house also, somebody gives you a birthday gift, you will be seriously opening and seeing it because you want to see if the color of the shirt or some, something you are given is up to you, I mean, your taste. So there is a particular taste. Each person has a taste. You may like a vada, I may like a donut. So it's, art also has that. I'm not bringing down the sensibility of art to that level. But in art, what happens is what you see and how you experience it visually, how much you gather from it is what. Many people think abstraction in the sense there is something very deep going on and all that. It is there. I mean, uh, the spiritual aspect is there. The artist practices it as a meditation, meditative process. And then he does a technique or something. He does something which what I can do, some other artist cannot do. What he does, I cannot do. So there's a mystery. He creates a signature through his work. He, by establishing a certain art form, she or he creates a particular style by which they are identified or by which they become very profound. Even they can produce works which become taken to the standards of becoming a genius. You know, so from just from a talent to a genius, it can be taken. So at what level the artist practices, how deep he is involved, how much he is study, how much he has meditated on that to do that, it all depends upon individual artists from where they take it. From the lowest point of studying in an art school to taking it to the higher level, how much of travel they do and how much of understanding they have down that subject. It's not about intellectual thing, how they gather the sensibility and produce a work of art. So this is Mother Well. I told you that he says it produces a hole in the canvas. And then this is Rothko. Mark Rothko was one of the turning point uh, abstractionists. And he deals with this space. In the final, he, he committed suicide. He cut his both hands. In a kitchen, he went and took a knife and chopped off his both hands and he committed suicide. He didn't even collect his money for the commissioned work he had to get. He, uh, this, uh, he was commissioned by, in Houston, there's a, I haven't, I haven't been there. In Houston, I'm told there's a Rothko Chapel. So that chapel has three paintings. It's a mostly violetish in color. And if you sit in, sit, the people sit and cry over the, see the painting and they weep also. So he is able to bring the tears into the eyes. The, he creates that emotion. So Rothko, uh, the man who commissioned him, before he could pay him, this guy uh, ended his life. But his works have got that space, quality of that space and inner, that mysterious space, what Paul Klee and all talk about, you know, the world beyond. So he creates that uh, sensibility in that. That's why in auctions and all that, his works are priced very highly. And the Sotheby's, Christie's, they uh, sell their works. And then uh, it's also in the top museums in all over the, probably all over the world. They are very large. They are very large. They are very large, massive size works. So this is Rothko's work. And then somebody was asking me if my child does doodling. You, are, you asked me? No. Somebody asked me here last time that uh, my child also does the doodling with color pencils and all that. You call that abstractions, he said. See, the thing is, whatever, when a child does it, you know, it will make even Picasso wonder how he does it. I have seen children painting like deconing. I have seen a child literally, the child is no more. He died young. But that, that boy, Dawal, he was a Maharashtrian boy. This boy used to paint like William de Kooning. And I said, he paints like de Kooning. Then he sh had a show in Alliance France in uh, Chennai. And the Alliance France director said, you are right, he is able to wait. But we are unable to know how he is. If you give him a canvas and some paints, he is regardless of who is there. He paints and he turns out an excellent canvas. So it's a child prodigy, you can say. But how it is evolved from, is it the vasanas from the previous birth or how it has come? Like there are musicians also, like flute, mandolin, Srinivas and all that, you know. So there are child prodigies who can play on piano. 
you know, which even uh, very senior players cannot do it. Even some, some people who play the, Chai, you know, the symphony, like Tchaikovsky or Ohan Strauss, you know, if you take them, they wouldn't be able to explain how uh, the child is doing that. So what happens as a child? Yes, what she creates is abstraction. Only thing is, you have, she hasn't shown in a gallery or we haven't seen her as an abstract painter. That's it. Now the same thing, when Tumble does that, you accept it. Tumble sells for millions. And his work, GC by Tumble's work, is one of the most expensive works. You can Google and see. But the museums are accepting it. Because, huh? A lot of this. And then you'll see Picasso, once Picasso was asked, Picasso was uh, asked by the New York Times or some, some uh, thing, they, they asked him. Uh, they said at the age of 90, at the age, they asked him at the age of 93, you are acclaimed as one of the top most in the world. You are, you are the master of cubism and then cubist school and all. And several artists are being inspired by you. The, po the post-cubist school, everything, even today people are doing cubistic. Uh, so he did that, you know, irrevocable three-dimension on a two-dimensional surface. So they asked him, what is that you have not done? as an artist. At this age, do you feel there is something falling short? But he did say that I could not paint like Modigalini. But what he said was, he said, at the age of 12, I painted like Raphael and Rembrandt. But at the age of 93, I'm yet to paint like a five-year-old child, he said. <laughs> so you know what happens is, at that age, the innocence. Now, Prakash was, I was asking him, how does the K-man do the distortion? How did he know? He does the antelope, he does the buffalo, he does the human forms with the blood and the pigments, iron pigments and all that, ores. How does he do it? He said it's innocence. So in innocence, even the caveman, who was our ancestor, he has done that distortion, which we are unable to understand what it is. But that innocence, you know, can create that. So it's a childlike, godlike creation, which is inexplicable. It's beyond our perception. That's why we believe in those dimensions. So a child, yes, a child is also creating an abstract. But an, uh, a Tumble studies that, and he practices a whole lifetime to get back to become the five-year-old kid. So when the art historian looks at it, he accepts, yes, you are true. You can become innocent and paint. But all, all, all the artists doing it, like the child, no. He, Tumble is the only guy who has done it in the whole entire world. So he is a forerunner. Once the uh, museum direct, uh, art historian accepts him as a forerunner, he is put into the museum. That is it. That's the uniqueness of the work. This is, again, I want to talk about the Indian artists. I don't, there are a host of uh, abstract artists, including me, down the drain. But the thing is, I don't want to say anything. I will have another day to explain about my works. But this is uh, V.S. Gaitonde. I, he's, he's one of the pioneers. I mean, he's undoubtedly. And when he was shown in the Solomon Guggenheim some years back, posthumously after he passed away, they showed his, uh, I'm sorry, it says Peggy Guggenheim. It's uh, Solomon Guggenheim now. So when he shows this work, uh, the art historians were questioned by artists and art historians why the art historians chose to show, show his retrospective. Then the, the art historian said that this, this artist, I mean the Indian artist, was the much more earlier sensibility than any, uh, any abstract painter. That means he was like a grandfather to even Pete Mondrian and Kandinsky. They, if they say he is much earlier sensibility, that's what it means, right? If he's an earlier sensibility, then what the American artists have seen. But he, was, he came later on after Mondrian and all that. But the way they studied about his work, they felt that this was much earlier. That means to say he is much, very much advanced in abstract painting. Galton, that's, that's the reason I brought some of his works here. See, these are the works. I think one of the, some work got auctioned for some 40, 40 million or something like that. This, these works are, the really great works of Gaitonde. Yes, was there Gaitonde or something. So, in conclusion of the abstract episode, a host of Indian artists followed by abstract trends to the present is there. 
So that explains the abstract uh, thing. I'll, I will stop at this because from here you can ask me questions so that to my ability I will give some answers. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. I don't see much of a difference excepting the way the color, the color aspect is very important because the color temperament is, it's something like this. We have the Harshna Kunkuma, isn't it? So the Harshna Kunkuma, when we see something, Anish Kapoor created one installation with the Harshna Kunkuma. He did the Harshna Kunkuma to show that all the, all the religions, all the things lead to one, one path. So that was his point. So, so yeah. 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 It's an abstract. There's no. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, sir. Very metaphysical. Very? Very metaphysical. Yeah, it is. It is. What are studying the ancient cosmogony? It is. It is. It is. It is metaphysical. It's metaphysical, yes. No, this triangular Yes. It is, it is, sir. Yes. You can see, and also you can see the several layers with which he has carefully worked. And then he has brought that balance in that composition, you know. And it's so powerful, the color also, you know, it may, it may not be, the Westerners have not attempted very few, like, uh, you know, tepees and all. The bottom you see across. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's like, uh, very true, very true, yes. Yes, yes. It, it's kind of shrouded. Very true. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, it is, yes. You can see that, yes. Hindu metaphysical concept, you know, in the background of his mind. Yes, yes. Very true. Huh? It's, a, it's a further evolution from that. See, metaphysical, when he says, metaphysical, again, yes, it's from. From theosophical point of view. Yeah. It, it, the seven it, principles of man, very much evident in this. It's a, yes, it's a, it's a evolution. Again, it's all drawn from there, you know. The basis, the basis was my earlier discussion about those things. So, while well, evolution, it, it automatically comes through the, uh, it's a soul's uh, passage, you know. It's a evolution through the soul. It's a travel. So, all those you will, you will be able to see. When you see a painting, and particularly what happens, the laity doesn't see that. He, he looks at it, at it uh, with a certain bewilderment because he expects the painting to speak. That's the level in which he understands. Today, my, one of my friends was saying that he can understand how light passes scientifically, you know, one uh, uh, per fraction of a second, how fast the light can travel, they, they say, but he is unable to understand what is abstract. So abstract is also a very complex thing which artist builds over the years and he comes to that. And it's a metaphysical plane. See, now metaphysics, when you take metaphysics, it can be figuratively expressed. If you see Akbar Padamsi's work, it's metaphysics. He says metascape. So where he shows the mountain and the sun, but there is a certain temperament. You can see that there is, he is showing something of a beyondness, a certain dimension which is non-existent. It's only in perception. It's not logic. It's a perception which you sense through your senses, not for your, you, you cannot mentally find out what it is. So it's, that's why what happens, it's on the surface for us to judge what it is. Is this painting available? No, I don't know, sir. I don't know because, because you can please take it. You, see, yes, yes, yeah. 
mentioned about uh, omnipresence. Yes. So this institution has a lineage of uh, Theosophic movement, and the founder of this institution, Vipi Valya, is a direct descendant of omnipresence. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. Yes. They are all again interconnected. You say Indian Institute of World Culture, right? So world culture means it engulfs everything. Your omnipresent comes under that. Even we people are coming under you <laughs> in one way or the other. It's a part of it. It's a part of it. Very true. It's a part of it. Even Sir C. V. Raman came and gave a 1960, I think it's about 73, 8 or 79, he came and gave a talk on Raman's race. Yeah. Sir, yes. Sir C. V. Raman must have, you must have known that. Sir C. V. Raman came. Very true. And that uh, is come out so deeply in this painting that you wonder. And because see, this this painting may not have come from its physical form, but it is truly a metaphysical creation. Yes. Yes, sir. That she is also uh, given her. <laughs> Very yes, good experience. No, this this is very true. This this is very true. That's why they this the four dimensions of intelligence. They say the buddhi, ahankara, manas, and chitta. So the buddhi is your intellect, which which you treat to the buddhi, and you create the identity, which is ahankara, and then the manas supports your identity. It keeps on arguing, and then to support your identity, the manas, the mind keeps working, which has accumulated knowledge, that's it. So when you give up all this, you come to the state of chitta, where you come into a plane where you are giving up all the, it's a kind of sarnagati state, where you give up all the thoughts and process and all that, and come to understand that the vast, you are part of the universe, not anything. So you stop yeah, that uh, non- It goes with alchemy also. Very, very true, very true. If you read The Alchemist by Pablo Coelho, you, know, you will see that. Finally, he comes to that ground where he digs, the, digs deep and finds what he wanted to go, it was right under his nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? It also shows as a face. It also shows. Yeah. Yeah, you can see, yeah, you can see that. But still, you, you have that feeling that it is there, you know. That is the thing. So, in, at the base level, what happens is, see, I saw a, a show by one... Uh, 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 Etios, uh, his name is uh, uh, Gabre Christos Desta. He is an Ethiopian. He did an uh, exhibition at IFAX Gallery. So this guy, what happened, he had put three words. One was showing all the uh, you know, pistons bombarding and all this. It had a factory atmosphere. The other one, you can see glittering forms. And the other one was uh, as if there is a uh, scuba dry, diver and then there's water, corals, and you know, sea. Kind. But it's all abstracted. But when you see without the title, you get this feeling. But when you see the title, it shows the first one says that underwater feeling. And the second one says crystalline. And the third power. So it gets connected. So art, the artist, the viewer, the painting, all stand on one equal platform and view, uh, they get the same sensation. You know, so it's painting is something like that, you know, you have to go deeper into that analysis, that dimension you have to get into to understand it. Now she gives all performances, why I'm saying is, some of it is, we cannot understand what it is. Only she has a, if she can explain, she can do it. Yeah, that's it. So it's like that. Yes, sir, please. Uh, abstract <coughs> sculpture agi bodo, painting agi bodo, adana maada dike experience mukya na, expression mukya na, adwa one creation agi. See, any creation goes by experience first.
Basically, you know, experience. See, without qualification, you go to school of art, you know. The reason is you want to learn first the basics, the fundamentals of how to draw, how to paint. Then you understand. See, the Matisse said, somebody asked him, do you see tomatoes the same way as the, all the public see? So now, Angadi Godaga, one kilo eshtamandra, atrupa, ipatrupa, we buy it. We, do you see like that or as an artist do you see differently? He said, when I, I see the tomatoes just like what everyone sees, but when I paint, I see it differently. How does he get that experience? Unless he paints, he gets that experience. So unless you gain the experience, your expression doesn't come through. So Gaitonde, when you go back to Gaitonde, he would also have been working in a class of a school of art and doing the sketching and all that. But he came to that level. All artists come to that. But how much of that uh, you understood, how much you could express, what is his individual capability? As he says, it's a soul travel. I said even a young boy can do like a William De Kooning, you know. So that is his because previously he has carried some vasanas and all that he does. We call him child prodigy. At a deeper level you see he as a genius. So how genius gets into it? From a basic talent it comes to the genius. What a lay person doesn't know, a talented person cannot do. What a talent himself cannot do, a genius does it. So thank you all, and uh, I thank uh, uh, Sanjay Chopalji, Chapalkarji also that uh, he has organized this, and uh, I thank all of you for having come to this and given support to all the students and others who would gain knowledge through this experience. Thank you very much.